sweat and balk. It's another late night with uh, your host, Nightwatch Nate. And tonight um, we're going to talk about a little... It's a tricky topic to talk about because... uh, you only knew how uh, hard it was to communicate what I plan on communicating through this podcast without getting banned for saying the, uh, I mean, there's this long laundry list of uh, words and topics that you cannot openly discuss on platforms such as YouTube, which is, has been my primary focus for better or worse I don't know but uh so that's where most of my you know my cute little handful of subscribers hang out I guess most often but I am uh trying more and more to cross over to other platforms that are more freedom friendly and uh actually allow you know real human beings to discuss important topics like what I'm going to attempt to cover tonight. Um, and it, and it, isn't it, uh, the fact that always, uh, it's always those topics that we can't openly discuss or, you know, are off limits out of bounds that are the most important topics for a reason, right? And so, let's dive into it, shall we? (sighs) Um, you know, if you feel like I feel, that this information should get out to a broader audience, you know, than just a handful of measly YouTube views that, you know, little crumbs that YouTube trickles my way, um, please share to your friends, family members, people on Facebook, Twitter, Gab, that's a good one, Parler, I'm not on there yet, but uh, plan on it once they get there, back on their feet, after that big tech censorship push, Um, wherever possible, please, help me out here, I'm, I'm kind of like, drying up on the vine, if you can tell, I'm starting to look all leathery, aged, decrepit, malnourished. So I need everybody's help in this little endeavor if you do, like I said, value some of what I produce um, as a content creative type of dude making this stuff for countless, I don't even keep track anymore, I don't even have, you know, never had a punch card in my life, but uh if I did, I'd, I'd take a hammer to it, a mallet, and just beat the crap out of it because I don't even care how much time I'm putting into this show. Just so you know. I got time. All right, I got time. It's winter. It's uh, been sub-zero temperatures, you know. I've got like a... I don't want to get into details, but uh, it's hard. I'm up here in the mountains, and it's winter time. and uh, what else do you do? Get a little cabin fever. You ever see that movie, The Shining? Yeah, that's pretty close to what happens every winter up here without all the killing, murder, red rum, and all that. Sometimes borderline, borderline. But, uh, you know, so I've had people ask me, um, what can I do to help the show? And, uh, you know, if there are people like me, they don't have all these, all that much financial means to throw out the show. And so I, you know, it's what I tell them is to just help me reach a broader audience. And that I think, you know, the more subscribers I get, the more views I get, the more people will actually see my videos when they're listing, when they're listed on Uscrube. And, uh, and then, you know, more potential for them to share with their friends. So that's the main thing. If anybody out there is wondering how to help out this super cool looking Nightwatch Nate guy, then that's how, okay? 
Roger. Affirmative. Right? Copy that. <clears throat> so this episode was um, inspired in part by... You know, another one of these strange dreams that I've been having lately. Um, you know, I don't claim to be any soothsayer or a oracle, you know. Some divine, divining person. Or, a, you know, I'm not claiming that I'm having these dreams and they're messages that are being conveyed to me from God directly or anything like that. But I think that um, dreams do hold significance, and it's, you know, in large part a subjective thing. It's a personal thing. And, uh, you know, sometimes they reveal parts of our character that, and our thought processes that, uh, you know, we might not never ever uh, stumble upon in our mundane, trivial, sober, you know, Calm, collective, cold, methodical, daily, mental <laughs> life. There's a lot of words. Getting a little wordy tonight. But, um, so that's the, uh, pretext. Is that the right way? The context of, uh, where I'm going with this. So I had a dream, okay? I had a dream. And it was another weird dream. I've been having these dreams for a while now. Anybody that's been paying attention... And there's a few of you out there. You know, I know I'm not completely alone in this endeavor. But, uh, so, as I say, or I've said, I don't usually remember dreams, and that's why they're significant when I do remember my dreams. And, uh, unfortunately, I've got a really, I don't know if I got hit on the head too many times when I was a kid. I remember stories of when I was a kid. From my parents, and I kind of faintly actually remember this, but it's probably just because it was traumatic, and the only things I remember as a child were painful, traumatic events. I don't know why, but I have not the best memory, you could say. Long term. Short term, I'm, I'm like a cat, I'm sharp as a tack. But, uh, see, so yeah, as long as I can remember, not the best memory. And uh, the few things that I do remember from dreams are pretty sparse. I mean, I hear these people, and I kind of wonder sometimes about these people you hear on different platforms, like YouTube, for instance. Evidently, it's it's A-OK -okay to be like a false prophet. You can be a false prophet all day long on YouTube. Never get banned, right? You can lead people... You can basically start up your own Kool-Aid cult with, uh, you know, the white Nikes and the purple and capes and all that. Tell them all you're going to beam up to a comet. You can, you can take people over the edge when it comes to cult-like religious followings, but, uh, yeah, just don't question the science. And I think that's about the only word that I can use is science, and it has to be in certain contexts. So I'm trying to self-censor, at least for this video, because the reason I have to is because uh, I'm kind of, I've been a bad boy. I'm kind of a thought criminal, and uh, I'm on my, there's a second or third, second ban, ban video. And I've been warned if I get three in a row, in a 90 day period, then bye bye. I don't know, or at least pretty harsh sentence. I mean, I feel so guilty just trying to communicate right now, right? Like, isn't that the uh, I just got off, uh, I listen to Clyde Lewis now and then, he's a great underappreciated talk show host, I like to say, one of the greatest, and uh. Yeah, he just he just uh, mentioned on a show that he put out a like a pre-release of the show. They put out like a, he's trying to build more of a since he's lost his uh, networks. He used to be a radio guy. 
Now he's going more and more online. That's about freaking time, man. But uh, so what he's trying to do is, you know, they're trying to start up their own media company. And he's got some great guys working for him. I mean, that must be nice to have actual people working for you instead of doing everything yourself. Like some of us out here. Uh, but he, he, he said that they do like these little pre-release videos now on YouTube. Um, just to prep people for the uh, what's ahead on the show. Nightly show. And um, all he said literally, and he played it live or on air, pre-recorded, whatever. Um, all he said was that uh, basically, you know, the science, the code word, the science. This I'm assuming this won't get me banned. Not as high profile, but we'll see, I guess. Cross your fingers, because you never know these days. Everything you say will be held against you. In this new Stasi-style system of speech police, thought police, thought crime, all that stuff. Good stuff. Or well, yeah, we're there already. Haven't noticed. Some people actually haven't. So I'm not sure how you haven't noticed what's going on online. If you're online, but you must have your head buried deep in a pit of sand. Anyway, um, so yeah, he just basically he said that um, in this, it's just like a little uh, two minute preview of his show, YouTube interview with him, the host. Um, he said that, uh, you know, what's the harm in questioning the science? And the science is kind of a code word for the technocracy, the ruling priest class, the elites who, under the cloak of science, are basically acting as gods. They sit up there on their little scientific thrones. Is that the right way to put it? I don't know. Uh, appealing to authority, um, head of these agencies. They can rewrite, ignore like they have been doing the medical science uh, for decades prior, make up the script, make up a new narrative, you know, like certain mandates. Mandates. Oops. And, um, oh, shoot. I should have, like, props. That's the idea. That's what I need to do. This is a cheap prop, but, uh, you know, like you roll up your sleeve right <clears throat> this is what I gotta deal with right now Cause this is how free we are in this country have you noticed does it feel free and that's and that's what made me think he got anyway I fin finished my sentence train of thought that's the hardest part sometimes but um yeah he got his video taken down by just basically stating um, raising the question, why is it so scary? Why is it so dangerous to just question science? What's wrong with questioning science? It's a pretty good question, right? Because, you know, as I've stated in the past, science that fails to question itself is no longer science. It's a cult. It's a religion. Science is always been intended to be open for open inquiry. And time and time again in the past, if you know anything about the history of science, the accepted official position of the established science, the uh, consensus, right, the scientific consensus, time and time again throughout history has been proven wrong by some radical that comes along and overturns all the all the science. Einstein was one. There's been several. Galileo. Some might say that wasn't science, but that was the official expert position of the day that the Earth was like the center of the solar system. It was flat at one time, right? Those were the experts. That was the priest class. Now that we're all falling back into this dark age mindset where you can't question and you can't discuss topics. Yeah. It's basically the same thing. We're digressing as a society, as a world. 
the world is being plunged back into the dark ages. I mean, if you just understand the thought process, the thinking, yeah, the issue of freedom or liberty of conscience, it's a big, big topic. Anyway, that's for a different time. Anyway, so that's, uh, so that story of Clyde, it just made me think of how, you know, it kind of sends a chilling, it's kind of like a chilling effect, sends a, to, you know, especially little guys like me, because I'm just trying, I'm just getting started out, you know, I'm just getting started. <laughs> you think you've seen something, you haven't seen nothing yet. I'm just getting started, though, and I'm like, this is your time we're talking about, this is my... Volunteer labor. This is my job. Not really, but uh, it's a pretty serious hobby, okay? Don't question my hobbies, man. So so to lose all that is... Mm, make me kind of angry. Hulk get... Want to smash things? If something like that would happen. So you gotta like... Tiptoe around and you gotta... Dance around the topic, the subject, and uh, yeah, it's like walking on eggshells. So this is chilling effect on the whole, on the whole conversation. And how dangerous is that? Think about it. Anyway, um, so back to my dream. Okay, I, never, I don't even think I started it yet, did I? Okay, the dream that led me to this. Uh, I swear this is going to be a shorter show. I promise. The dream that led me to this whole topic tonight was, um, okay. It's really short, and there's only a few key elements that I can actually re recall because my recall is so bad. And uh, so, I, you know, of course, I shine up, polish up those little memes, those little concepts little visual symbols I kind of you know make a big deal about it because that's literally all I remembered anyway talking a lot so what I remember is there's this uh, there's a huge snake out in the yard it was pretty intimidating because I mean this thing had like like big not just one, but two heads, two-headed snake. They look like a snake. I don't know. It was a two-headed snake, and it was being, I don't think it was being attacked. I think it was attacking, trying to eat a little um, reptile. Right? Follow me. Good. And so there's a struggle going on. Between this double-headed snake and this poor <laughs> little reptile that was trying to like bite back and fight its way out of the grasp of the snake, and eventually the snake, like its little tail, you know how they do, they constrict, choke um, their prey, and that's what happened. Poor little guy. He had a little snake tail around his body or throat, whatever. And he died, and the snake ended up... The funny part was I I ran back in the house. It was probably like one of those things, like all my dreams now, like I'm running to go find my camera so I can go capture it, and I never capture it. That's another thing. I think maybe some... Yeah, Carl Jung. Anyway, Freudian, Carl Jungian, whatever again. Um, camera's slipping on me, isn't it? Son of a... Okay, um... Whatever that means. Anyway, that, that's probably a totally different topic. So I looked up, oh yeah, the snake. So I came back out of the house and uh, you don't see this every day. The snake was running away with the lizard in his mouth or whatever. I'm not sure how a snake runs away. But that's the uh, impression that I got. So, okay. 
Anyway, so it got me thinking of this uh, imagery of the snake, and in particular, double-headed snake, which I guess is a thing. I mean, I've known of the the pole with the double snake, um, two snakes going up the pole, as a symbol of medicine for a long time. And let me pull this up. So the caduceus. There it is, right here. William Hayes Ward, 1910, discovered that symbols similar to the classical caduceus sometimes appeared on Mesopotamian cylinder seals. He suggests the symbol originated sometime between 3000 and 4000 BC. So again, always back to Babylon, right? And that it might have been the source of the Greek caduceus. So there's an older origin than the popularized Greek version, but because, as is always the case, seemingly, all these um, symbols lead back to Mystery Babylon, Babylon, and the confusion of the Babylonian system. So, yada, 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 somebody uh, incorporated Dr. Ward's research um, into his own work, published 1916, in which he suggested that the prototype of Hermes was an oriental deity of Babylonian extraction. So I didn't even read that, but, you know, obvious. Babylon. Represented in his earliest form as a snake god. Hmm. Who would that be? Serpent of old, maybe? As is mentioned in the Bible. From this perspective, the caduceus was originally represented representative of Hermes himself in his early form is the underworld god Ningishvida, messenger of the Earth Mother. Interesting. Earth Mother. It's a popular topic these days, isn't it? Mother Earth. Things don't, you know, things don't change very much in the course of human affairs. Nothing new under the sun. What has been done will be done. King Solomon saith. The caduceus is mentioned in passing by Walter Burkert. And quote, really the image of copulating snakes taken over from ancient Near Eastern tradition. Yeah, you ever seen like a snake pit? It's pretty uh, graphic. They're always like slithering all of each other and stuff. <laughs> pretty sure. <laughs> I'm pretty sure that's a. Uh, not for a younger audience. Uh, anyway, um, let's skip around. But you'll see these images. I mean, you see the imagery of, uh, and there's this commonality of snake worship all over the world. I mean, the, uh, so that was the other one I, I stumbled on was the um, Mayan or Aztec double-headed serpent god thing. And this, you know, I'll get to, it relates to the rod of Asclepius. Asclepius. Um, which is the single snake on the rod, which is symbol which uh, the Who uses for its witchcraft. Because, I mean, I'm not sure how else you can use a divining snake, a healing snake, a, uh, as we'll see, snake that imparts divine wisdom. I'm not sure how you can use that symbol and not be blatantly associated with Satan. Satan. Okay. Serpent of old. So these people are Satanists. Anyway, uh, moving on. Uh, da, 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 da. Let me just, I'll read this quote, I guess. You, know, you got to read this stuff. I mean, you got to read. If you want to learn, you got to read. It's just the way it is. 
So that's confusion with the rod of uh, Slipius. It says here on Wiki. You know, it's, it's an okay source. You can't just take it at face value, but when it's got references, you can use Wiki now and then. It's okay. I'm not completely discredited, am I? Medical Corps, uh, Corps. I always read Corps. In the U.S. Uh, Army Medical Corps. That's their little symbol. Anyway. Confusion with the rod of Asclepius. It is relatively common, especially in the United States, to find the caduceus with the two snakes and wings, by the way. The wings, the wing serpent. Does anybody else catch on to this stuff like dragons? Wing serpent in the Garden of Eden on the tree. Flying serpent. Wisdom imparted to Eve. Big promise, you shall be as gods. You shall know right from wrong, good and evil. And if you don't read the Bible, you probably never make that connection. But I'm not here to, you know, get all preachy, but I'm just saying. This is pretty in-your-face stuff right here. I won't be taking up a tithe offering at the end of the show or anything like that, but I do appreciate a um, tip. If I ever see one, I'd appreciate it. A lot. Probably put a shout out or something like that. Definitely be a big deal when I finally get one. It's going to be like, what? Where'd that come from? Anyway. Um, <laughs> so to find the caduceus, the two snakes with wings um, and wings used as a symbol of medicine instead of the rod of Asclepius with a single snake. Um, this usage was popularized largely as a result of the adoption of the caduceus as the insignia of the U.S. Army Medical Corps, which is interesting. That goes back to 1902, and there has been kind of a recent new push for the militarization of uh, medicine. I don't know if you... That's a different topic or a different show, but yeah, we got... National Guard troops on the ground helping with the Asclepius program. And that's, yeah. Anyway, um. Da -da 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 -da. So that's how they, okay, associate it being so prominent, I guess. The rod of Asclepius is the dominant symbol uh, for professional healthcare associated in the United States. One survey found that 62% of professional healthcare associations use the rod of Asclepius for their symbol. This is data. I'm just getting it out of the way. Some survey, uh, the same survey found that 76% of the commercial healthcare organizations use the caduceus symbol. So they you use both interchangeably, evidently. The authors suggest the difference exists because uh, professionals associated one more likely to have a real understanding of the two symbols, whereas commercial organizations are more likely to be concerned with the visual impact of a symbol will have in selling their... And that's interesting, isn't it? The merchants. They, they realize the power of symbols. And there's a lot of, you know, subconscious underpinnings behind the use of symbols. You see them all over the place. The uh, cult symbols... Masonic, whatever. Um, mostly all go back to Rome and, and uh, these corporations. They really do, I think, assign a magical power to their logos and their symbols. And, you know, how far that belief system goes, obviously it's a big deal. Because they flash them all over the place constantly, so... Uh, so here's a quote. The god of the high road and the marketplace, Hermes, was perhaps above all else the patron of commerce and the fat purse. I like that. Fat purse. As a corollary, cor corollary, he was the special protector of the traveling salesman, the spokesman for the gods. He not only brought peace on earth, occasionally even the peace of death, there you go. Bill Gates. Right. 
I mean, I guess you are pretty peaceful when you're dead. But his silver-tongued eloquence could always make the worst appear the better cause. Hmm. Deception? Slightly. Maybe. From this later point of view, would not his symbol be suitable, suitable for a certain congressman? All medical quacks, book agents, purveyors of vacuum cleaners? Rather than the straight-thinking, straight-speaking therapist, as conductor of the dead to their subterranean abode, this guy's eloquent, man, I tell you, his emblem would seem more appropriate on a hearse than on a physician's car. The Caduceus in Scientific Monthly, 1932. Stuart L. Tyson. Interesting. Anyway. And it's a alchemical symbol in computer coding. I didn't even know that. Fascinating. Let's skip over to this one. So the rod of Aslipius. The single snake. And again, this is just preliminary prepping. This is not... This stuff shouldn't, anyway, get me banned. But uh, And I'm not trying to get banned. I never said I was. I'm just uh, running through my mind how I'm going to cover the later parts of the show. In Greek mythology, the rod of Asclepius, sometimes also spelled... Asclepius, or, yeah, Asclepius, also known as the Staff of Asclepius, and as the Asclepian. Okay, got all that out of the way. Is a serpent-entwined rod wielded by the Greek god Asclepius, a deity associated with healing and medicine. Symbol has continued to be used in modern times. I'm starting to talk like Captain Kirk, and I don't know why. The symbol has been uh, continued to be used in modern times, where it is associated with medicine and healthcare, yet frequently confused with the staff of the god of Hermes, which we just read a little bit, tiny, tiny smidgen about, even though it sound it was like painfully slow to read through. The caduceus, yes, we understood. Uh, theories have been proposed about the Greek origin of the symbol and its implications. And there it is, if you can see it. Old school, yeah, little staff. Looks like a spike, kind of, but whatever. Staff with a serpent twined around it. Which is interesting. And I'm going to skip around here. Very interesting. With this other bit of news recently. Okay, so we know that um, these people, Bill Gates, had a connection with Epstein, and uh, Epstein was trying to populate the world with his seed God complex, like they all have people with too much money, they all get God complexes, and they're all psychopaths, they're delusional, and they think, they truly believe that original lie in the garden, I believe, from what I've researched and what I've read of their own Statements, Klaus Schwab, right? His great reset. Um, on the videos, they're talking about what what you're going to merge with machine. And that's like something out of a, a sci-fi, like um, Blade Runner. Well, you know, it's kind of cool. It's a good movie, but... We are wondering what is happening to the world. Everything is changing. The very idea of human being some sort of natural concept is really going to change. Our bodies will be so high tech, we won't be able to really distinguish between what's natural and what's artificial. Inside our own heads, is the most complex arrangement of matter in the known universe. You might ask yourself, can we get to be superhumans? The 
original Industrial Revolution was driven by the discovery that you could use steam engines to do all kinds of interesting things. But that was followed by additional revolutions for electricity and computers and communications technology. We're now in the early stages of the fourth Industrial Revolution, which is bringing together digital, physical and biological systems. One of the features of this fourth Industrial Revolution is that it doesn't change what we are doing, but it changes us. With the ability to visualize brain activity, for example, through a simple consumer-based EEG device, it gives us access to ourselves in ways that we've never before thought possible. It unlocks the black box that is the brain and enables us to um, really, truly be able to uh, realize an identity that is aspirational. There's now a scientific foundation for the effects of mindfulness on the brain, on the genome, on biological aging. And when the human mind does know itself, then you get the potential for a new renaissance that restructures itself in terms of our relationship to life, our relationship to the planet, our relationship to work. We need a different economic model. And by that I don't mean capitalism versus communism. What I'm talking about is a shift in the system along the lines of the two big changes that happened in the 20th century, Keynesianism, with a much greater focus on health and education and the role of government working with business, and then a reaction against that in late century to neoliberalism, where the focus was on free markets, freedom of the individual, and getting governments out of the way. We need a shift to a new system that will allow us to meet the basic needs of every human on the planet, that will live within planetary means, that will be fairer, and that will be focused as its key goal, not on growth per se, but on maximizing human well-being. And history tells us that a value shift is triggered by creation of a new story about how we want to live. I see the circular economy as something which fits very closely with mankind's goal to be innovative and creative and to always progress. We can use asset tracking, we can use IT, we can use 3D printing to enable this different economic model to recover materials, feed them back into the economy and, and really to decouple growth from the resource constraints we have. The reason we live in cities is not different today than it was 10,000 years ago. Even if we have got networks connecting us, we still want to have places where we meet in person. Well, this means the place where we work and the place where we live are much closer to each other, a city where we don't need to have big supply chains in order to produce things, where many things can be sourced locally thanks to 3D printing and robotics. So if we are able to do something to transform cities, to make them more efficient, then the impact can be huge. Think about the prospect of getting rid of plastics. We must not only be inspired or informed by nature, but actually use natural organisms with which to design products and building parts. Only instead of varying material properties, we're varying biological functionality. Design is critical today because it's the first signal of human intention. So the question of adding quality to quantity, it isn't a matter of simply circulating things that are potentially toxic. It's circulating things that are safe and healthy for all generations. So the goal is no longer, I want to be less bad, less monotonous, less unsafe, less unjust. It's really about a diverse, safe, healthy, and just world with clean air, clean water, clean soil, clean energy. Together we are fighting to preserve our fragile climate from irreversible damage and devastation of unthinkable proportions. If we think about the original Industrial Revolution, it was an energy revolution. I like to think of it as a kind of bookending of a period in human history during which we used fossil fuels and it worked very well for us for a long time, but now we have to bring that to an end. We have energy technologies that can power our civilization, solar, wind, uh, biomass. So then the question is, well, how do we get grid integration? Maybe the wind is blowing in Denmark. The sun is shining in Germany and now you can move that electricity through an integrated grid. You can supply energy to everyone who needs it and you can supply energy at all times. Walking around 
when you do see different stuff as um, far as like the body marriage line they use a lot of things that help them lift up and move things to the car you just sit there and you know program something and if it has its own set mind to go ahead and do everything and then as humans we just come in and take the extra step to help the technology it's not the the cure-all for everything there's definitely a lot of things where people perform the operation better but certainly for the right applications robotics are a huge improvement for the process the prediction of 5 million jobs lost by 2020 to technology is serious, but it's not the main question. Construction, manufacturing, services, public health and education, these industries will still exist. The main question is, what will be the future of work? How will we define work? How will we share the wealth? Well, from the viewpoint of the, the labour or jobs, now the, uh, we really need a new education or new training. We're working with a world in motion in FIRST Robotics, trying to encourage you know, students from third grade all the way up through uh, the end of high school. We um, had students make sailboats, and then we had them race them, and so they could see how quickly they could move. And they immediately went back and started to say, oh, I saw what happened, I'm going to go change this or that. And that was third graders. I just given a prize to a kid of 18 years old that has discovered something really very, very unique. Came up with how to get better productivity and better yields for seeds of corn. And so he basically came with the idea that if you would perforate these seeds, you would get more food. And uh, you think about it and say, but he didn't go to university. So how does he get all that knowledge? And he told me, I mean, I've been watching YouTube since the age of 12 and I'm so interested that I've seen everything about it. I've read everything about it. The world is really open uh, to learning. The thing is, uh, how do you give the incentive to your kids to do that? It's this ability of digital technology to change outcomes, to truly empower people all over the world that can create a more equitable growth because I think the world needs that. Fourth Industrial Revolution has the potential to make inequalities visible and to make them less acceptable in the future and hopefully to gather and garner political support to take the necessary decision to reduce the gap. Humans have always been using tools, but because of the recent advances in technology, we're beginning to have machines that can augment us in all sorts of interesting ways. I was the first person in the world to be able to voluntarily move my legs while stepping in a robot by exciting the nervous system using electrical stimulators directly onto the spine. We believe that a cure will be possible if enough of the right people have the will to fast track a cure for paralysis. We take two things from the patient. Um, first, we take a three-dimensional x-ray and we extract the three-dimensional data out of that so we can make a perfectly shaped puzzle piece. And then we also take a sample of fat tissue from the patient so that we can extract the stem cells out of those. And we use those stem cells with this three-dimensional scaffold that we fabricate and after three weeks we have a piece of living bone that's uh, ready for implantation. Being able to use genome editing to understand the genetic changes that lead to cancer and technologies like uh, drug delivery, getting molecules into particular types of cells. There's a lot of excitement about being able to move much more quickly on this disease. One of the things that I think is so essential to free and open societies is freedom of thought. Um, and up until now, the conversation we've been having is around freedom of speech. Once we can access people's thoughts and access people's emotions, um, we have to create a space that enables people to think freely, to think divergent thoughts, to think creative thoughts. And in a society where people fear having those thoughts, uh, the likelihood of being able to enjoy progress is significantly diminished. We need to take responsibility at every level of society, from the individual and the personal to the institutional to the global, to adapt to these technological challenges and changes which are redefining what it means to be human, what it means to work, what it means to be completely embedded in this world. People always ask me if I'm an optimist or a pessimist. The technology exists, but how do we get it and implement it 
at the scale we need at a price that people around the world can afford. Even though we have everyday problems, we have to solve, we have to find a way to lay the foundations for the innovations of tomorrow. These people are being led by, in my mind, as a Bible believer, down a... They're deceived, just like Eve in the garden, by this same serpent whispering in her ear that ye shall be as gods. And they believe their science, you know, which they worship as their savior, will one day save them. That's why all these people like Epstein, Gates, whoever, all these people, um, pour money into life extension technologies. I think even Musk, I was reading about, was donating some of his fortune to life extension technology. Because, I mean, if you think about it, if your kingdom's on earth, which, you know, these people are all about amassing wealth and influence and power and through force of will or whatever connections, um, influencing. See, these people don't, I don't know how many people have thought about it. I've thought about it. A lot, too much, maybe, but these people do not think the way a lot of you and me think, not motivated by the same things. So they're driven by ego, by a need, desire to control, to be a, to leave their mark on history, right? Ultimately, I think the science, they, in their minds, they think the science is almost there. This long-awaited promise from way back in the garden is finally almost fulfilled. That ye shall be as gods. Not we, of course. Like some of these, oh, these, some, some of these people that think average people middle class and they believe in science and they believe it will save the human race someday and we'll all become like little gods do you think honestly you'll be part of that club even if there was such technology you think the elites like Bill Gates who talk about you know, the number one factor destroying the earth is uh, overpopulation and, you know, through vac... Through... Difficult. That was close. That could have got me in trouble right there. But, um... Do you think those people are going to care less about all you? Do you think you're going to be on board their little... their little arc of immortality through their uber technology no you're not going to be part of the club sorry you're going to die so you might want to find out something else to have hope in other than science and science can't take the place of God I'm sorry it, it tries they try to more and more so, it seems. They try to like answer all the questions of the universe that you can never be measured. Nobody was ever there to witness the Big Bang or the early universe, but they play gods and tell us that they know exactly down to the you know, minute millisecond how things went back then. Billions and billions of years ago? Okay. And I just take your word for that. Okay. Because you're the expert. Because you went to college. 
Uh, I know that sounds anti-science, but I'm actually all, I'm all for science. That's real science. Because science will just reveal, from a creationist point of view, it'll just reveal, reveal the complexity and, you know, awe-inspiring nature of God, ultimately. The grand architect, whatever you want to call him. Okay. So, where was I going with this? That's the question. There's a famous temple um, of Asclepius. Was at Epidaurus, northeastern Peloponnese. Peloponnese. Another famous healing temple, or a slipion. So this was a religious healing. They even have. Let me see if I can find it. We'll skip through all that. Um, they say there was even a um, particular non-venomous snake that was often used in healing rituals. This is not. This is about. They're kind of a nice little, it is a nice gateway to modern science, isn't it? Because I, I'm, I'm pretty sure these uh, snakes were probably about as effective as the... Pointy things. Uh, so this is about a cult. Okay, from 300 BCE onwards, the cult of Asclepius grew very popular and pilgrims flocked to this healing to his healing temples to be cured of their ills ritual purification would be followed by offerings or sacrifices to the god uh, the supplicants would then spend the night in the holiest part of the sanctuary the abaton any dreams or oh See, I never made this connection until now. It's all, it's all starting to make sense. I could probably start my own cult at this point. If I was a little more devious. Any dreams or visions would be reported to a priest who would prescribe the appropriate therapy by a process of interpretation. Some healing temples also used sacred dogs to lick the wounds of sick petitioners. <laughs> Which is actually kind of interesting because they did find later on in science that don't they say dogs' saliva is like dogs' mouths are some of the cleanest. Are they even cleaner than ours? I think they might be. Because they have so many um <laughs> for a layman's term you know, I'm just trying to not confuse people with all my big words that I don't know, but uh, properties in their saliva that fight off infection. So maybe that was part of it. I don't know. Pretty weird, though. You have dogs licking you. I mean, what happens if they, you know, get a little hungry, take a little nibble? Not going to help the situation any? The wound? And then it goes into the original Hippocratic Oath, began with the invocation, I swear by Apollo, the healer, and by Asclepius, his son, and by Hygienia, Hygiene, and Panacea, you've heard of that word before, right, in medicine? Pharmacaea, Panacea, it's like a cure-all. And by all the gods, so this was like a religious ritual. The serpent and the staff appear to have been separate symbols that were combined at some point in the development of the Asclepian cult. 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 It's a cult. It's not science. It doesn't question itself. The significance of the serpent has been interpreted in many ways. Sometimes the shedding of the skin, renewal of emphasis on symbolizing rejuvenation, 
you know, let's just leave it all airy fairy because we don't acknowledge the Bible ever. And that's what these people, how these people are trained to think. While other assessments center on the serpent as a symbol that unites and expresses the dual nature of the work, the apothecary physician, apothecary physician, who deals with life and death, sickness and health. The ambiguity of the serpent as a symbol and the contradictions it is thought to represent reflect the ambiguity of the use of drugs. Yeah, there's a little ambiguity there, isn't there? Drug in the population, big pharma, pharmakeia, Greek word, witchcraft, in case you didn't know, that's a thing, that's where it came from, pharmacy, which drugs can help or harm, as reflected in the meaning of the term pharmacon, I like that, sounds like Comic-Con, I guess, I don't know. Which meant drug, medicine, and poison in ancient Greek. Pick your poison, right? It's kind of like today with pharmacaea. You know, I try to I try to tell people, you know, try not to get into this uh, spiral of prescription drugs because time and time again, you know, I've seen from people in my life that you take one drug and it gives you symptoms and you have to take another drug. And that drug gives you more symptoms and you got to take another drug for that drug. And eventually it's like, you know, the cure, isn't it the case Some sometime, most of the time, maybe even that the uh, cure is worse than the disease? Yeah. Like the opium crisis we just went through. I mean, everybody forgot about that already, right? Like... Man, all of a sudden we're all back in love with Big Pharma. Because number one contributor to the news media is Big Pharma, drug companies. Obviously, they're going to kind of paint them in a favorable light. So, however the word... They become less ambiguous when medicine is understood as something that heals the one taking it because it poisons that which afflicts it. Meaning medicine is designed to kill or drive away something and any healing properties as a result of that thing being gone. Right, so you're trying to eradicate the body of a foreign agent that's Killing or poisoning the body. Basically is what they're trying to say there. Products derived from the bodies of snakes were known to have medical properties in ancient times. And in ancient Greece, at least somewhere, aware that snake venom that might be fatal if it entered the bloodstream could often be imbibed. Snake venom appears to have been prescribed in some cases as a form of therapy. Man, it sounds a lot like uh, chemo. Take this poison, it's going to help you. going to do, do you right. Fix up that immune system by destroying it. Why I sound like a monster right now, I don't know. I've been listening to too much Fauci. <laughs> uh, okay. Where next? Where do we go next? This is interesting. Let me read real fast. So I guess that snake oil is where that whole concept comes from. Snake oil salesman. Theologia Gracia Compidium. Chapter 33 offers a view of the significance of both snake and staff. Slippius derived his name from healing, soothingly, and from deferring the withering that comes with death. Hmm. A little morphine, maybe? I don't know. Is that 
kind of the concept. Like, yeah. Put you to kill you softly. All this reason, therefore, they give him a serpent as an attribute, indicating that those who avail themselves of medical science undergo a process similar to the serpent and that they, as it were, grow young again after illness and slew off the old age. Also because the serpent is a sign of attention, much of which is required in medical treatments. The staff also seems to be a symbol of some similar thing. These guys talk like they've never... They're obviously out of their expertise because they're not like archaeologists, biblical scholars. <laughs> I mean, this is a common... They just got through the fact that this was like a symbol that goes back to Babylon. And they're like trying to add all these like airy fairy concepts. This is the kind of crap you got to weed through, especially on Wiki, in order to find like actual concrete truth. This is why all this stuff takes time research. There's a theory. Let's just call this one a theory. Some commentators have interpreted the symbol as a direct representation of traditional treatment of draconciliasis. Yeah, I've heard of that. That's bullshit. Okay. Um, it's like a tapeworm, and uh, they're like, hey, it comes from this worm thing. This is disinfo. I'm reading to you right now, and I don't know why. Bible scholars, on the other hand, look to the book of Numbers in which Nehushtan was a brass serpent on a pole that God told Moses to erect, saying that anyone bitten by a snake would live if they looked at it. This biblical account of the earliest known record of the pole-serpent combination, though the exact configuration is not known. So, I'm surprised they even referenced the Bible, to tell you the truth, but... So here we go. We have the serpent on the pole. In the book of Numbers. Moses lifted up a staff with a serpent on it and told Israelites that anybody that's bitten by a snake if they looked on it, would live. Anybody that knows anything about the uh, gospel should recognize that that's an obvious reference to Christ being lifted up on the cross, on the tree, on the pole. Some depictions even show, you know, Christ on a, a straight staff. Although we know that the uh, T-shaped cross was a symbol for Tammuz, the sun god, the uh, Roman method of torture and execution. But uh, So yeah, if you ever see the cross, just think of a T, Tammuz, sun god, T for Tammuz. Um, so, I've always, I read that and I was like, What? Supposed to look at the servant to heal us? How's this mesh with the don't listen to the serpent lying serpent of old devil adversary? And the more I thought about it was fascinating how, you know, the the gospel story, Christ died on the cross for our sins and he took on the sin of the world. So he, in a sense, think of this as my own interpretation, but I've, I'm a little bit of a Bible scholar myself, I guess you could say, without calling myself that. Student, we're all students. We should always, should always be students. We're not experts. Nobody is. Ever learning, that's the key. Like a child, like Einstein. So, um, yeah, according to my own 
extrapolation from my understanding of uh, Scripture. At that moment, literally, Christ became sin, which the um, symbolic example of is the serpent in the garden, fallen one, Satan. And one might even say that he even died for Satan, if, you know, it were possible. Even Satan could turn from his wicked ways and be saved, right? That's going a little far left field, but I'm just saying. So in, in, any, in any case, the snakes symbolic of, and the poison symbolic of sin, if you're bit, if you're contaminated, if you're born into this world and are a sinner, you look to the serpent on the pole, you look to the cross for healing your salvation. And, uh, yeah, it's interesting how different medical symbols use one serpent or two. Why would they have two? If, you know, you take it from the biblical account, anyway. It would be one serpent. One um, rebel. One author of death, sin, and suffering that was staked to the cross. Another symbol is in uh, Genesis where the woman, the church, um, her heels bruised by the serpent, but her you know, foot crushes the head of the serpent. So we know who wins in the end, right? If we believe. Anyway. So this episode has taken a little bit of a turn. A little bit bizarre, I guess. Direction. Uh, unintended. Um, but it's interesting. That's what I find fascinating about history is, and there's so many layers of depth. And, uh, in this instance, I hadn't even planned on venturing down this, uh, snake hole, shall we call it? Or, uh, maybe it's a rabbit hole that the snake wandered down into bit us in the butt on the way. I don't know. Anyway, um, this is fascinating. I didn't intend to expand so much on this topic. I have a lot of other things to talk about, such as, I don't know, I guess for some people more relevant news articles, the here and now, you know, the present. But this, I think, you know, lays the groundwork for a lot I think if you understand our history, then you know where we're at and you know where we're headed, hopefully, or have a rough idea at least. Um, because as Solomon said, there's nothing new under the sun. I'm here at the uh, sacred places and practices. And again, this is just the uh, wiki resource here on Eslipius. Eslipius. You don't want to slip over your words when you're talking about Eslipius. You might need a, to go to a Eslipia. I don't, I don't even know. Yeah, a temple. Okay. Um, the most ancient and the most prominent Eslipian, that's what I was trying to say, or healing temple, according to the uh, geographer of the first century. B.C. Strabo was situated in Tricola in the first century A.D. Pool of Bethesda. Described in the Gospel of John, chapter 5, right? So, and was actually found by archaeologists in 1964 to be part of the Asclepian. So, I find that interesting just as a 
Bible-based kind of dude. You know. And I wasn't even intending to, whatever, make a big deal about my, about religion and all that stuff. But, um, uh, one of the most famous temples of Eusclepius was at Epidurus, Epidurus in northeastern Peloponnese, dated to the 4th century B.C. Um, yeah, so I wanted to look up uh, Gospel of John. Let's do that right now. Uh, go over here. John chapter 5. It takes us over here. <clears throat> Bible Gateway. Decent resource. King James Version. John 5. And this is, uh, I mean, just the um, synchronicity. Is that the right word? These stories that have been played out time and time again throughout human history. And it just seems like Everything is secular, circular, secular. Things just keep repeating and repeating. And so, I don't know, I, I always try to put myself in the context because I think there's still valuable lessons to be learned in the Word of God. After this, there was a feast of the Jews, and Jesus went up to Jerusalem. Now, there is at Jerusalem by the sheep market pool, which is called in Hebrew the tongue, the Hebrew tongue, Bethesda, having five porches. In these lay a great multitude of impotent folk, of blind, halt, withered, waiting for the moving of the water. So they believe these were healing pools. Because, as we just read, Bethesda was related to a uh, Asclepius. And were therefore part of the Asclepion, his little healing centers, which we'll get to shortly. So here was this uh, place, Asclepion, a temple for healing, religious temple. Symbolized, by the way, by this commonly used till, till this day. Serpent or serpents on a pole. The pagan symbol for this guy was worshipped as a god of healing. Asclepius. Who was the son of Apollo. And we'll get to that. Anyway. So, we're at these pools in this pagan, Greek, religious, cult, healing center, and uh, there's a bunch of these um, multitudes, they say. They were kind of dropped off there, whatever, all these sick, lame, maimed people, and they, they were looking for healing, right? And it describes, for an angel went down at a certain season into the pool and troubled the water. Whosoever then, first after the troubling of the water, stepped in, was made whole of whatsoever disease he had. I mean, right there, you know, warning, warning. You know, sounds like a scam. And they got to keep this scam going because they are the healing temple, right? So, you know, I wouldn't put it past them. I wouldn't doubt if they had, you know, somebody in the, in the crowd that was faking it. And he somehow, you know, would get in there first or have the appropriate people 
shove him in the water first. Like a crisis actor or something like that. But, um, and then, he, you know, they'd come back and be able to walk around just fine. And that would keep this religious ceremony, which, by the way, you know, it was, it was making some money. All the uh, people that would go there for healing would be asked to uh, give a donation kind of thing to pay for this. Probably mostly, for the most part, phony religious practice. Which brings us to the modern day and age, right? What flies is science these days. Or the science of medicine and healing. Um, so, so according to the myth or this story, there's an angel that goes into the waters and troubles the waters. And the first one in is healed. And a certain man was there which had an infirmity infirmity 30 and 8 years 38 years that's a long time when Jesus saw him lie and knew that he had been now a long time in that case he said unto him will you be made whole and the impotent man answered him sir I have no man when the water is troubled to put me into the pool But while I am coming, another steps down before me. Right? Crisis actor. Part of the plan. Probably an actor. I don't know. I'm just guessing. There could have been some miraculous healings, but... Jesus said unto him, Rise, take up your bed and walk. And immediately the man was made whole and took up his bed, and walked. And on the same day, it was the Sabbath. Yep, and the, uh... So in a later, uh... I'm gonna leave it there, I'm not gonna make a whole sermon out of this, but, um... In a later time, he says, you know, is it not lawful to pull your ox out of a ditch on the Sabbath and how much, you know, more valuable is somebody who's suffering God to heal them on the Sabbath. So their, their understanding was perverted of the uh, keeping of the Sabbath. They're all about rules, 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 and not so much love thy fellow man and, you know, keep the truth in spirit and in truth wholeheartedly. But, um, I digress. Let's go back to the, um, so it made me think of, um, uh, that in this current context, there was this medical cult, basically, promising healing. But it was, uh, probably a, a scam, big scam. And, uh, Christ stepped in, Jesus stepped in and uh, healed him through faith. Faith in the one true God, the true physician, the true healer. So now you have this uh, conflict. In my mind, as uh, I see it, you have this uh, medical establishment, which we'll read about here. Let me see. So, I looked it up in a slipion, a slipion, pronounced, I don't know, anyway, um, were healing temples located in ancient Greece and in the wider Hellenistic and Roman world, dedicated to Asclepius, the first doctor demigod of Greek mythology. So this is a god, according to Greek mythology. Which is pretty funny when you when you start reading about it, but uh, we'll get there. Slipius was said to have been such a skilled doctor that he could even raise people from the dead. Interesting, huh? 
So stemming from the myth of his great healing powers, pilgrims would flock to temples. Built in his honor in order to seek spiritual and physical healing. And that's what Beth Shezda was one of those temples. Esclepions, I'm going to pronounce it different every time, just so one of those times I get it right. Esclepions included carefully controlled spaces conducive to healing and fulfilled several of the requirements of institutions created for healing. I love how they talk around in circles. Treated at these temples largely centered, or treatment at these temples largely centered around promoting healthy lifestyles with a particular influence on a person's spiritual needs. Characteristics of the Asclepian was the practice of incabatio. I think that's Italian. I think that's uh, incabatio, like incubation, right? Latin, also known as temple sleep. So this is where I was like, ears, eyes, whatever, perked up. Because this whole little uh, journey of learning, I guess. Like Ouroboros, whatever, the snake eating its own tail. It's kind of, I keep hitting the mic, I don't know why, but it, um, it's heading back to the, the same thing. Anyway, the origin, the beginning of this whole thought process. It's blowing my mind right now. Anyway. So the temple of sleep, the temple sleep. This was a process by which patients would go to sleep in the temple with the expectation that they would be visited by Asclepius himself. Creepy, a little bit, slightly. Or one of his healing children in their dream. That's even, I don't know. It's like, I don't know if I want to run into those guys. During this time, they would be told what it is that they needed to do in order to cure their ailment. So this was like a type of witchcraft or a seer or soothsaying. Who knows how legit, right? I mean, there could have been people like behind the walls like whispering at them. Who knows? Anyway, this was a religious cult center. A lot of superstition back then, right? Not so much science-based, but actually, when you think about it, not all that much different compares to what goes as this science today. What passes as the science today. Got it? Okay. So they're in this little e incubation chamber, literally. And, uh... They're going to be visited by either Asclepius or one of his healing children, they call them, during their dreams. They would be told what it is that they needed to do in order to cure their ailments. Okay, I already went over that. At the very least, they would wake up having not been directly visited by a deity, deity and instead report their dream to a priest. The priest would then interpret the dream and prescribe a cure. Cure. Often a visit to the baths or gymnasium. Like Bethesda. Preliminary treatment for admission into the Asclepians was catharsis or purification. It consisted of a series of cleansing baths, purgations, purgations, accompanied by a cleansing diet, which lasted several days. So that's interesting. It's kind of fasting. You know, there's some science behind that aspect, you could say. Clean up your diet. You are what you eat. You have toxins in the body. Try to expel them. Despite these methods being regarded as faith healing... They were highly effective, as is evident by the numerous accounts uh, written by patients attesting to their healing and providing detailed accounts of their cure. In Asclepian, 
In the Asclepian of Epidaurus, three large marble boards dated 350 BC preserve the names, case histories, complaints, and cures of about 70 patients who came to the temple with a problem and shed it there. You know, you might have forged a couple, paid off, bribed, I don't know. Could have been real, some of it. Some of the surgical cures listed, such as the opening of an abdominal abscess or the removal of traumatic foreign material, are realistic enough to have taken place. So they think that they were actually legit. With the patient in a dreamlike state of induced sleep known as inchiomesis, not unlike anesthesia induced with the help of soporific substances such as opium. Back to opium again. Hmm. Pharmacia. Witchcraft. Interesting. Uh, Slippians also became home to future physicians as well. Hippocrates is said to have received a medical training at the Slippian on the Isle of Kos. Prior to the becoming the personal physician of the Roman Emperor Marcus Aurelius, Galen treated the studied and studied at the famed Islipian in Pergamum. There's a picture of the runes. Here's the interesting part. Been trying to get to. Okay, so Asclepius and the cult of Asclepius. This is a cult. There he is. And, you know, there's different uh, interpretations. I don't know if you ever watched uh, any of the Joseph Campbell series, Power of Myth. So there's two main um, camps. There's the uh, people who believe that there's some, like, innate, something in our, like, you know, like a Carl Jung meme that travels on in our minds just over generation after generation that that leads to these common myths or stories that's a little more far-fetched in my mind than an actual real life event that happened that became oral history you know and and kind of digressed i guess or uh Got all dressed up in different uh, mythological stories, and that's what I think a lot of this is like the you know what came first the uh, Moses with the staff for uh, Slipius, or there's the you know the devil has counterfeit theories too. I don't know, but there's obviously a correlation here with this you know this guy holding a staff with a serpent on it. So, there he is, a Aslipius holding the staff with a snake wrapped around it that serves as the inspiration for the symbol of medicine. Here is a pagan Greek god with his magical serpent staff, okay? <laughs> and the, for some reason, the modern information scientific technological age has chosen to continue to embrace that symbol for whatever reason and the large transnational agencies like the uh, who world health organization have also decided to pimp that symbol Let's just call it pimp. I don't know why, but... So here's this Greek god. And the uh, cult of Asclepius. In Greek mythology and religion, Asclepius was the god of medicine, descendant of the god Apollo and mortal Coronis. His name means to cut open. It is said that he was named as a result of his mother's childbirth experience, during which her womb had to be cut open in order for Slibius to be born. Known now as a Caesarian, Caesarian section. 
And like they say, all, all uh, traditional cultures have some personification of a divine healer or miracle-working physician. You know, even Jesus in the uh, Christian belief structure is considered the great healer, the physician, in my mind, the true one. But, yeah, make up your own. The ancient Greeks had... Asclepius, the god of medicine. In Homer's Iliad, Asclepius was a man, a physician to soldiers wounded on the battlefield of Troy. But by Hippocrates' day, he had become elevated to the status of god. And this is the point that I thought was funny. It's like, I'm sorry, but, uh, you know, I'm pretty sure there's not too many people that will offend out there anymore in this day and age that by making fun of Greek gods, mythology. But it's like literally listening to an episode of uh, General Hospital or some kind of TV drama sitcom. It's a little hard to take seriously, but this was their religion of the day. Again, I choose mine based on the Bible, but these people, this was their belief system. So, Slipius father, Apollo, was uh, himself a patient god of medicine. He was through Apollo that Chiron, the wise and peaceful centaur, learned the art of healing under Apollo's mentorship. Chiron grew in his craft, so much so that Apollo himself entrusted Chiron to train his son, Slipius. Okay, we got all that. Through his studies, Asclepius became so deft, I like that word, deft at medicine, especially the art of surgery, that he was able to return the living from the dead, they say. His abilities quickly grew attention and jealousy. And you can hear like that obnoxious violin and music in the background right now. Tension. As one story goes, Asclepius was killed by Zeus at the request of Hades, the god of the underworld, which is a word used in the uh, Bible that some people get confused with a literal place called hell, but different topic, different time. Uh, who feared the god of the underworld, who feared Asclepius, was stealing souls away from him. So, story goes. Asclepius was killed by Zeus at the request of Hades, the god of the underworld, who feared Asclepius was stealing souls away from him. Got all that? I mean, that's... Man, that's a lot of drama for the gods. I think the gods would be above drama. I keep hitting the microphone. Too expressive tonight. Um, I think the gods would be above drama, but I guess not. Not the uh, Greek gods. Not the Greek pantheon. I almost messed up that word too tonight. It's getting long. It's getting late. Um, Greek pantheon. See, I know these words. Before his death, however, uh, Eslipius had several children, including Machion, Podarius, Hygieia, and Panacea, who themselves were regarded highly as highly effective healers. And uh, like we talked, panacea for one, hygiene, uh, good things to have, but for some reason there are still words that refer to the Greek gods. Starting around 360 BC, the cult of Asclepius became increasingly popular. He was admired for serving people despite their class and social status. That's pretty nice, huh? Social justice warrior, this guy. Which was not a common practice by Olympians. Bridge of freaking schnabs. Doctors claiming to be the direct descendants of Asclepius referred to themselves as Asclepiads. Asclepius was further um, survived in modern times by the symbol of the snake wrapped around the staff, which is seen throughout all medical infrastructure as well as the American Medical Association in modern times. I digress. This is interesting. This is 
I started out talking about my dream. And then I just started sitting here in front of a camera reading randomly for some reason, apparently, or seemingly randomly, right? This actually has a lot to it. Deeper meaning than you may know. I'm being foolish. Um, so yeah, in these temples, procedures performed at uh, Laslipians, Aslipians, we'll figure that word out soon. Promise. Procedures performed at Aslipians, um, so they had this holistic approach, right? Um, emphasized therapy, natural environment, interesting little special locations, uh, there were two steps in order to be a patient, to be considered to be treated at the uh, Slipion. The first of which is the catharsis or purification stage. This is when the patient undergoes a series of baths and other methods of purging, such as a clean diet over several days and purging their emotions through art. That's interesting. Art therapy. Got that today. The patient would then make an offering such as money or a prayer to the temple. Money. Always gotta get that money, don't we? Make that green. Priest of the temple would then give the patient a prayer in which it would ease the patient's mind and create a more positive outlook. It's all about thinking positive, guys. Um, afterwards come, comes the incubation or dream therapy. Patients would sleep in the abatan or incumaterion. It's a weird word. Getting so tripped up on my words tonight. Because I'm reading Greek. It's not easy. Unless you're like a Greek scholar or something. <sighs> so they would sleep in the dormitory located in the Aslipion. Here they would be lulled into a hypnotic state. Now the truth comes out. Likely induced by hallucinogenics. That helps, right? That was some tripped out dreams. And then they begin their dream journey. They uh, slept. They were visited by Aslipius or his daughters, Hygieia or a panacea. So now it says daughters, children, whatever. These dream visitations were also dis um, prognostic in nature, revealing the projected course of the disease and ultimately the patient's outcome. During this time, patients would recount their dream to the temple priest, who would then prescribe a treatment based on their interpretation. Other dreams were less direct and more symbolic. The physician... Priests at the Slipians were also master dream interpreters. They just, like Bill Gates almost, they just, these guys are experts at everything. <laughs> so there are dream interpreters that would uh, divine the treatment to be followed from the patient's account of the dream. The god, Slipius, had certain totem animals in which guys... He liked to visit the supplicants as they slept. That's pretty... Sounds like a bad trip to me. There were the dog, the rooster, and of course the snake. <laughs> so that sounds like a pretty tripped out uh, ceremony there. Um, so they were drugged up, told to go to sleep, and this guy would like freaking freak him out with little animal sock puppets or something. <laughs> anyway, so the whole uh, the concept here was the, uh, this is what these medical institutions and huge powerful agencies that we little guys, we little Americans say, not just Americans, but I'm in America, so I'm going to speak as American. We can't question this priesthood. We can't question the who or their guidelines. That's what got my videos banned. Um, that's what got
got Clyde Lewis in trouble. Questioning the science. The religion of science. The technocrats, the priesthood. The gods, right? And that's how, that's the dark age mentality. I always bring up the dark age because I'm a, a fan, is that the right way to put it? Of the, there's a lot to teach us in the, there's a lot of light that can be drawn from the darkness, right? So if we see how people were controlled and kept in, just, how they were kept in utter depravity, these despotic, hellish conditions throughout history, we understand what led people into that system where that type of oppression, that type of control, manipulation, crimes against humanity. To understand the conditions that led to that kind of societal condition, right? So... Um, this mindset that Martin Luther stood up and he uh, said, I can do no more. My conscience compels me, right? I am following his own understanding of scripture. The paper Pope, it was called, right? The, uh, the principles and the ideas and the uh, wisdoms that were transmitted, transcribed, and interpreted in the common tongue during the Great Reformation, which later led to the Enlightenment and the Industrial Age and all the freedoms that we have today, were quickly, too quickly, falling back into that same dangerous state of a the state or the officials or the priesthood dictating what is acceptable communications truth deeming thoughts words ideas as dangerous to society that is what is dangerous Controlling ideas, controlling our thoughts. And this whole, this is just the part one, I guess, of this uh, discussion. This whole chilling factor that, you know, you can't, you can't talk about that. You can't talk about this. You can't question that. That's a way to control our very ideas, our very thought processes. When we have to self-censor in order to communicate with each other, which is what social media is all about, right? I gotta wrap this up. I wouldn't rather ha um, otherwise have readily available within my close proximity, within the audible range, sound transmitting through the atmosphere into your ear canals. <laughs> Technology... You know, I thought it was designed to, uh, remember Bill Gates, remember that quote Bill Gates said, it's going to draw us all, it's going to keep us all together, guys. It's going to draw everyone closer together. Little Kermit the Frog voice. I need to dress up. I got to get a pink sweater sometime. Do my Bill Gates impression. But that was, uh, I'm not trying too hard tonight, I'm tired. Um, yeah, whatever happened to technology was going to help us communicate what happens when we can't use words to describe things anymore ideas i mean so what i get from this is i had this dream of a double-headed serpent and it led me down this rabbit hole and the serpent followed with me i guess um so it actually got me, um, I looked it up. I looked it up. And uh, 
you know, it, it led me down a few paths of uh, dreams and dream interpretation. And then I was led to the, uh, this is a recap, if you weren't aware, led me to this uh, Slipius and the uh, the staff and the serpents and the, the current medical establishment, medical tyranny, I affectionately call it. And it goes back to dreams and soothsayers and priesthoods. How does all this fit into our current world? Tune in next time. Thank you.